Oh, it is. Praise the Lord. Somebody, somebody say, I love Jesus. I think I have Sebastian's Bible right here in case he wants to get it. And uh, he's going to need that. And uh, praise God. He calls that his dagger in Jesus' name. Is anybody grateful to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Well, so am I. Praise God. I love Jesus. Um, reminder, men of war, this Saturday. And uh, we are having a, our first youth-type event uh, this Friday between 6 and 8 p.m. You don't want to miss that for the kids. Um, I This first one, if you are 8 and over, you want to be at it. And uh, we're going to have a good time in Jesus' name. That means Aaron's 8, right? Hey, praise. Look, he's smiling over here. He's excited. We just... We did a good deed today. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, let us pray. Let's pray that God helps us tonight. Really excited for this lesson, part 39. Some incredible principles here that God is about to bring out. And uh, I want us to pray that God helps us extract these lessons and uh, believe in God to do a great work in each of us. So would you pray with me here for a moment? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. What a blessing to be in your presence. We're so grateful for our brothers and sisters that are able to be here, those that are paying attention online. Lord, we pray that you would bless our service tonight. Pray that you teach us the divine principles of the Bible. Help us walk out of here at edified Jesus. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And everybody said amen. Okay, really quickly, uh, I want to kind of give you a short story here. Nothing too long, but nonetheless important, and that is um, Brother Marx, who is a considered a prophet. Lord Jesus, that white noise is scary. Um, hello, praise the Lord. Okay, and so Brother Marx was talking at our our ministers meeting that we had the last uh, was it Wednesday, no Thursday, Friday. And uh, his last opportunity to speak, he, he was hyper-focused on being like Jesus. And he talked about how one of the greatest problems in the entire movement of the Jesus name movement is that we don't have enough people striving to be like Jesus. And so he, hype, he was hyper-focused. So him and I caught up afterwards, and I, I was telling him that we were doing, you know, 39 weeks now of Jesus. And, and he told me himself, he said, you know, it's hard for people to become what they don't know. And uh, so this is why we're studying Jesus Christ, because as we enter into the end of time, the end of time moments, the end of time temptations, the only way that we're going to get through it is with Jesus. And, um, you know, the pastor gets assassinated. They, they do a bunker busting bomb on my trailer and I'm gone. And guess what? Guess who's going to lead you? Jesus. And so we have to have a great grasp of who Jesus is um, so that we can make it. And everybody said amen. amen. Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's get to Matthew 21. So this is part 39. Now, these are some of these principles. One of the things that I want you to pay attention that, about Jesus' ministry, we've been 21 chapters into this, but pay attention to this. Repetition is the only way that people produce mastery. Repetition is the only way people, is the only, the only way people remember things. So one of the things about Jesus' ministry is you find that he teaches the same principles, but in different angles. So it's the same exact lesson, but he, he gives it to you in a different variation. So that when you catch it, you're like, wow. But God's like, I've been saying that for the last 20 chapters. Okay. And so tonight we're about to see some things here that, that are not new, but they may be new in this chapter, and I also hope that tonight, as, you, as we read through these verses, that it does something to your mind. I, I am praying that you walk out of this Bible study and that you have a greater appreciation for the Scriptures. Like, I, I really want you to see how God puts the Scriptures line upon line, precept upon precept, how it all works together, and how it should give us a hunger to study this even deeper. Amen? Look what the Bible says, Matthew 21 and 1, the Bible says, when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, praise God, somebody has me on live, somebody help me, Jesus, I don't even want to hear my own voice, God, help us, Lord. Uh, they were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, and I want you to pay attention to this simple phrase, then sent 
Jesus to disciples. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Then sent Jesus to disciples. In other words, Jesus is making his triumphant entry into what's about to be his crucifixion. And this whole time, for the last three and a half years, he's been discipling specific men and women. And, and again, he goes to them and he sends them to go do something. Now, why is Jesus sending them to go do something? Well, it's simple. Jesus is trying to continue to teach his disciples to obey. He's, well, I, I want you to pay attention to this. Mark 16 and 15. And he said unto them, this is after he is resurrected. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature, right? So when he's resurrected, he goes back to them and he says, go into the world, go preach what I'm telling you to preach. Well, notice how God doesn't tell them this then. He tests them with little things. Go fetch me some bread. Go fetch me a fish. Go pay this. Go here. Go lay hands there. Go up to the mountain with me. I want you to notice how God, as a master discipler, starts with little things before he gives them big things. Before he ever tells them to go preach about the bread of life, he teaches them to go into the city and bring bread. Part of discipleship is us understanding that God is going to send us to do little things before we do big things. And if someone cannot do the little things that God is asking of them, why would God entrust them to do the big things that are associated with souls? Amen. You see, go into the world and preach the gospel has to do with souls. So if God can't trust you to go get bread, why would he trust you to go reach those that are heading to be dead? It's part of discipleship. So some people think when the pastor tells you to go do something simple, we view it as, I can't believe I'm being asked to do this insignificant thing. But you got to understand, if you can't do the insignificant thing, why would God trust you to do the most important thing? Are you seeing that connection there? Yeah. Now, I want you to pay attention because this is, this is incredible. So be, he, he tells them they got to go into the world, preach the gospel. But before he ever told these two guys to go preach the gospel into all the world, he first told them to do this. Look at verse number two. Saying unto them, go into the village over against you. Straightway you shall find and uh, I'm going to just read the word because it's there. An ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. Notice how in Mark 16, 15, he tells them to go and do something, to say something. Okay. Well, before he ever tells them that, he tells them, go do something, go say something, go into a city, go into a village. I want you to do this, loosen this, get a hold of this, and bring this to me. This kind of sounds like soul winning. We go into our city, we say what God tells us to say, and then we bring them to the house of God. Because the Lord has need of them. I want, I, I want, I, I want you to catch this. As Christians, we must be willing to go and to say and to do exactly what Jesus commands. And I, now, now, here's an even greater revelation. God says the Lord hath need of them. God is revealing that the Lord has needs and it's twofold. He has need of things he wants to use, and he has need of people that are willing to go get them for him. God has a need in this hour. The Bible says the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. 
There's plenty of souls to reach, but there isn't enough people willing to go and say and do what God says. And if you're here tonight and you're wondering, why am I here? That's why you're here. God is trying to convince you to be somebody he can send, he can anoint, he can use, and you can go out there and do and say what he wants you to do. Amen. That's part of being a Christian. Yes. That's, the whole that's the whole point of being a Christian is to go do and say what God says. Everybody said amen. amen. Now, why is Jesus telling them to do this? Because this is actually deeper. This is actually deeper. This blew me away when God was showing me this earlier today. Sometimes we think that what we're doing is insignificant. What's the big deal? Jesus is sending us into a village to untie an ass and a colt and bring them to him. What's the big deal? I mean, Jesus, can't you send somebody else to do these insignificant things, these nonchalant things, these non-important things? Why are you sending me to go do this? And unbeknownst to us, the very thing that he's asking us to do is part of a greater purpose. I'm going to show you. This is what the Bible says. Next verse, please, Sister Paige. All this was done. What's the all this? Going into the village, untying the ass, grabbing a hold of the colt, bringing into the city. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying. Are you catching that? They thought what they were doing was insignificant, and they had no idea that God was saying, I need someone to fulfill scripture. I need someone to fulfill a prophecy. I need someone to be a part of something that will forever be canonized. Or maybe I just get more excited when I see these things, but this is kind of, it, it bubbles me up a little bit, so forgive me. What did the scripture say was going to happen? Next verse. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an and a colt the fowl of an ass what does that mean prophecy needed the vessels and somebody had to go get them so that prophecy can be fulfilled and so that the king can come and so they just thought man how come i'm on how come I'm on animal duty tonight? You're not on animal duty. You're on prophetic fulfillment duty. You're doing something greater than you even realize. Hello? Amen? Man, sorry, I get excited about this stuff. Look at the next, look at the next verse. Now, the disciples are about to respond, but, but, but I want you to pay attention to this. Jesus was asking them to be a part of fulfilling scripture. Now, this is my concern. You ready for this? Somebody just say amen. Okay, I'm glad you're ready for this. You know who else fulfilled scripture? Judas. See, our behaviors will fulfill scripture. I can fulfill Judas' scripture and betray Jesus for things of the world. And end up hanging myself. Or I can fulfill this prophecy where I bring the Lord things he needs. I get to pick which verses I'll fulfill. Now, I, 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 I want to I dismantle this because this is very important. Jesus doesn't ask us to violate scripture. Did you catch that there? The God of the Bible, the Jesus of the Bible, will only ask you to fulfill Scripture, to obey Scripture. So when another Jesus is taught to you and the other Jesus is telling you things that violate Scripture, it's not the Jesus of the Bible because the Jesus of the Bible asks you to fulfill Scripture. Amen. That's how you can discern a different Jesus or the same Jesus. Amen? Now watch this. How did the disciples respond? 
And the disciples went. Did you catch that? What made them disciples? They went. Look at this. What made them disciples and did? What do disciples of Jesus do? They go and do as who commanded? Hallelujah. As Christians, we must develop to the point where we obey the word of God, not fight the word of God. As Christians, we must develop to the point where we don't fuss against the word of God or try to wiggle out of it, but we obey it. How does God build a church or extend salvation to others? Do you understand that if Jesus did not have two disciples to go and grab those two animals and bring them to them, there would never be a cross. You'd never be forgiven. You wouldn't be on a pew. There wouldn't be an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Prophecy would be null and void. This is all interconnected. So we, we, we have to ask ourselves, is this a new principle? Is obedience to God a new principle? Well, I believe it's not. Genesis 6, it looks like the disciples were in great company. Look what the Bible says. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. Are you catching the same? Are you seeing how they're in good company? Noah did it. They did it. Why? Noah obeyed and did everything that God told him to do. Brother Shannon, you're a framer. A boat that size probably should have had more than one window. Hello? There should have been more than one window and probably more than one door. But Jesus wanted one door. You know why? Because he knew that he was going to come in the flesh and say, I am the door. He knew, there were, he knew that he was going to be able to say, hey, I am the, I am the window. Yeah. See, God was preaching oneness since the, since the ark. Yes. Yeah. You, you got to catch this. Can you imagine, because listen, I'm just, I'm ghetto like this. Can you imagine being Noah and being like, we really don't need all this stuff. Yeah. But I want you to notice this. Because of the, because his his life and his family were on the line. He was willing to do everything God commanded him because he understood my opinion doesn't float. It sinks with everybody else's. Everybody else's opinion drowned. And Noah understood I don't know why he wants all these animals. I don't know why he wants the boat built like this. I don't think we need all this stuff. I think we need more windows. I think we need that. And God's going, this is why I didn't tell you to design the ark. Because if I would have let you design it, you would have built something that sank. But I'm building something, and I'm telling you to build something that doesn't sink. And that will help you and your family survive. Hey, listen, folks, guess what? I got a lot of pride in me, and you know... God humbles me when he makes me do things that I don't think are necessary. Well, I don't think it's necessary. You know what? Thank God Noah didn't think the way you think or he would have drowned too. There's a revelation built into what the disciples did there. When we're not willing to do what we view as unnecessary, God looks at you and says, you don't understand it's critical to salvation. What's... what? I would have took Jesus just one. He only needs a donkey, right? I don't need the coat. I would have been like, hey, you don't need all this stuff. Just get, get you one. And in fact, Jesus, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to get you an unridden one. I'm going to get you one that's been, that's been tempered and tampered and one that you can ride and have no issues with. But Jesus didn't pick one that's been written before. He said, no, I want one that hasn't even been sat on yet. Jesus said, I want to be the one to break it. Hey, can I tell somebody here today? Don't make Jesus break you like a you-know-what. Because believe it or not, God will make up out of you. Man, I'm teaching so good right now. My God. It's in there. I'm not twisting it. It's in there. He will use you for good or bad. Depends on what you choose to do. 
Somebody say, help us, Lord. Okay, I, I have to nail this home because we're, we're trying to be Christians here, and here's a critical point to Christianity. Christians need to be willing to obey the word of God. Our response to the word of God will either fulfill positive or negative side effects of Scripture. Example, and I can give you a bazillion, but I'm going to give you just a few. Proverbs 11, 14, look what the Bible says. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. Well, I'm not going to talk to nobody. I'm just going to do whatever I think. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. Hello? Anybody out there? Where there is no counsel, the people fall. When you do things without godly counsel, the Bible wants you to know, write the check. It's going to happen. You're going to fall. Because it's either God is true or a liar. And God doesn't lie. So God is letting you know ahead of time, no counsel, you'll fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So God says, hey, I'm going to give you some counsel so that you can avoid falling and you can actually be safe. That, that's a positive or a negative side effect of scripture. And guess what? All of us fulfill it. How many people here can be honest enough today to say, I've done things without talking to God. I've done things without talking to the man of God or to the people of God or getting counsel about it. And I've suffered the consequences. Do, do I got a witness in the house today that we've lived that before? Amen. Hey, guess what? That's God letting you know I'm not a liar. You don't believe. Okay, next verse, Sister Paige. Come on, we got to get this into their blood, into their DNA. Look at this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. Okay? But remember, this man has no counsel because it seems right to him. Okay, what is, this, what is the consequence of it? The end thereof are the ways of death. Now, listen. I don't know about anybody else here. When I read this verse, you know what it makes me want to do? Is not be right in my own eyes. Yeah. It makes me want to seek God and seek the word of God and seek the counsel of God's people. Because I'm like, listen, I don't want to be so deceived that I think I'm right only to find out that I'm wrong when I'm dying. Ain't that amazing how it works, how God lets you know ahead of time, like, hey, if you do things this way, this is the result of it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good God. Wow. That's a faithful God. That's a God that's trying to save you headaches, nightmares, and pain wow. by letting you know ahead of time. Now, I'm going to insert this because I want to help somebody here understand this. Okay? Where there's no counsel, people fall. Multiple, a multitude of counsel. There's safety. There's a way which seems right into a man. The end of are the ways of death. Okay. What did God place on the earth to help us from that? Well, he gave us the Holy Ghost. He gave us the word of God. Hey, this is the smartest man in the room right now. <laughs> Hebrews 13 and 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves for they what? How you doing in that? I'm expecting Sister Kaufman to make me some carrot cake because she's, I'm watching for her soul, and I need it to watch for the soul. And I'm expecting some of that graham cracker thing you made, Sister. And Sister, Sister Reamer, I need those, those chicken sandwiches you made last time. I need some of those as well. Sister Amy, I'm going to wash it down with the thing of pozole. And Brother Tanner, we're going to have a little bit of your quesadillas. Man, it's going to be a good night tonight. I just need all that so I can keep watching for your souls. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you can cook, Brother Shannon? Brother Shannon, you've been summoned to the sheepfold. I need to watch for your soul, brother. I got to eat, man. Come on. He watches for your souls. Guys, I'm trying to help people understand this. God places the word, the spirit, and the man to help you avoid falling, avoid death, avoid losing your soul. This is God's way of saying, I love you so much 
that I will literally give you my spirit, I'll give you my word, and then I will literally torture a young man for many years until he becomes someone I can use to watch over your soul. I'm not the finished product, but he's working on me, okay? Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah, man, I, that's exactly right. Hey, now do you understand why Moses responded the way he did when God called him? Yeah. Moses was like, no, nah, man, I'm not going. I am not. I've tried to help Israel. I killed the guy trying to help. I, I'm not good at this. I don't want to do it. Send somebody else. I'm not built for this. I know how Moses feels. I know how Moses feels when he's like, God, feed them. God feeds them. And then the next one, they're like, oh, Moses, you're so annoying. And, and Moses is like, my God, I can't win with you guys. If I leave you in Egypt, you're miserable. If I take you out of Egypt, you're miserable. If I preach this, you're not liking it. If I don't preach it, I did it wrong. If I show up, I'm, it, it, there's no winning with people. But that's the key, is us understanding God is actually so concerned with my salvation and my soul that he puts these things into my life. There's no reason to resist if you're a Christian. Somebody said amen. amen. Look at this. Look at verse number seven. So they went and did everything that Jesus commanded them to do, brought the ass, the colt, put on their clothes. They set him thereon. Look at this. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees straightway and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Everybody say moved. moved. Saying, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. Did you catch that? Amen. Are you catching that? Yeah. The people are non-Christians. These are Jewish people. If non-Christians were moved to worship Jesus the way they did because they simply knew him as a prophet, are you catching me? Brother Shannon, in my opinion, because I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a man's man. In my opinion, take, spreading my clothes on the floor, cutting down branches from trees and strawing them on the way and crying out these things, in my opinion, is a mellow, it's a little bit melodramatic. And they did all of this simply because they believed that Jesus was a prophet. Yeah. Oh, I'm fixing to rub somebody here the right way or the wrong way, no matter how you look at it. How much more should we be worshiping Jesus knowing he's more than a prophet? Amen. Yeah. How much more passionate should you be about Jesus? Hey, the last time I checked, he's the word of God become flesh. The last time I checked, he's the express image of the invisible God. The last time I checked, he's God manifested in the flesh. And so when we worship Jesus, what we are, what we are supposed to do as Christians is have the revelation of who he is. And the revelation of who he is is supposed to move our spirit to worship. You don't believe me. Okay, great. John 4.23, uh, 4, please. Even the cars are worshiping. Praise God. Everybody, I, I, I want you to watch this. But the hour cometh. Everybody say, and now is. Everybody say, that's right now. Oh, yeah, it's right now. When the true worshipers, everybody say true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. If your spirit is not moved to worship Jesus, it's because you don't have enough truth in your mind to move you. When you know who he is, it stirs your spirit. 
It stirs you so much that it don't matter who's sitting next to you and who's not sitting next to you, and it don't matter what's going on in your life, and it don't matter what you think or don't think. You know what happens? You know who he is and what he can do, so you start to worship him in spirit because of the truth. I don't worship him because I feel like it. I worship him because I actually believe this is God. This is the presence of God. This is the way of God. Oh, but you guys are clapping your hands. You guys are shouting. Hey, I'm fixing to give you a little bit more. Give them verse 24. Look what the Bible says. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why do you think people can walk in and when our spirit is worshiping Jesus because of the truth that we know he is, it starts to move them. It moves them because they're going, my God, what am I feeling? You're feeling God who is a spirit moving in the midst of the spirit of his people. All because of truth. Isn't that amazing how it works? Oh, it gets, it gets a little, well, pastor, I just don't believe in clapping my hands, and I don't believe in raising my voice. I got a remedy for your infection. Here it is. Give him the psalm, sister. To the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. I want you to read that first line with me. Oh, clap your hands, some of you people. Oh, clap your hands, all the non-shy people. Oh, clap your hands, all you that are not ashamed people. Hey, I love how the Holy Ghost works. He says, oh, clap your hands. I really don't like when pastor tells me to clap my hands. I'm not telling you to clap your hands. Somebody else is telling you to clap your hands, and it's the Holy Ghost. Because if you believe the Bible the way I believe the Bible, the Bible says that the Scripture has been divinely inspired by God, which means God told a man to tell you and to tell me that when you get in God's presence, you better clap those hands, you better lift up that voice. The Bible says, shout unto God with the voice of defeat with the voice of insecurity with the voice of shyness with the voice of intimidation no you know what God's trying to do he's trying to make a Christian out of you and in order to make a Christian out of you he you got to get into his presence and realize I don't care what you think I'm clapping my hands I'm raising my voice why because I know who God is are you catching that it's right there I'm not this is not Greek, and it's definitely not Hebrew, praise God. Pastor, I don't think it has anything to do with who God is that we clap our hands or raise our voice. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're resisting it. Let me show you what the scripture says. Look at the next verse. Everybody say, for the Lord. Most high is terrible. He is a what? He is a what? Brother Victor, the psalmist is saying, clap your hands. The king is here. Shout with triumph. The king is here. We're not doing it. He's not saying clap your hands because you feel like it. He's not saying clap your hands because everything's going right. He's not saying clap your hands because you're not shy. He's saying, hey, you clap your hands because of who's here. You lift up your voice because of who's here. And that's why you do it. You got a revelation of the king. Christians are not ashamed to worship, especially when God can look back in his Bible and show you that non-Christians were willing to worship him for just knowing he was a prophet. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Oh, we're going to dig today. Now we get to the third point that I'm, oh, this one, this one really got me, Brother Matt. This one really got me. I want to see if you guys catch it because it's so exciting. At least pretend you're interested. Like get on the edge of your seat or something. Like lean forward like you're hungry or something. That's exactly right. You ready? Look at this. Verse 12. Here it goes. 
and Jesus went into the temple of God. Are you seeing it? Are you catching it? And Jesus went into the temple of God. You're not, you're not seeing it. All right, I'm, I'm ready to, re- I'm going to release it right now. Sister Paige, can you release it real quick? Give him that first Corinthians. Ah, that's so good. That's so good, it makes me just shiver. Right before Jesus is crucified and rises again, he goes into the temple made with hands as a type and a shadow that Jesus is going to go into. Ah, God, help us. Know ye not that your body is the temple of God. Jesus was showing us, hey, This is my last pit stop into a man-made temple. I'm going into you now. I'm getting into your life, into your heart, into your mind, into your spirit. Hey, this is is the scripture. Hey, let's read that again. You ready for this? Uh, No, no, give them Colossians 127. To whom God would also make known the riches of his uh, glory for the mystery among the Gentiles. Everybody say that's us. Which is, everybody read it with me, which is, which is what? The hope of glory. My God. You see, in the temple, in the temple, the Shekinah of God would descend. And what God is saying, here's a mystery among the Gentiles. They kept that temple spotless, blameless, clean. And only then would the Spirit of God descend. But here's the mystery that God is saying. His dirty, nasty, sinning Gentiles can open up their heart and their mouth and God will put Christ inside of them to give them a hope of glorification. Amen. Hello, everybody. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Don't believe. Well, I don't think I need Jesus on the inside. Look what the Bible says. Give him some Romans. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have what? What? What, What's the consequence? Sounds pretty important. Sounds pretty important to have Jesus inside of us. Go back, sister, to uh, Matthew 21 and 12. I I, I want them, I want them, you got to catch this, folks. God gave us a prototype to what he was fixing to do with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. When Jesus entered into the temple, okay, you ready? I want you to pay close attention what happens when Jesus enters into your temple. Look at this. Cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. Overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. You wonder why the Holy Ghost being inside of you is tension. See, when you get the Holy Ghost, there's tension going on. Because when the, when the Holy Ghost enters into you, the Spirit of Jesus Christ enters into you and you're allowing him to make you a temple, the Bible says he's fixing to cast out all things contrary to him. You wonder why you get the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden you start deleting things and getting rid of things and throwing things away and stop doing things and you cast things out of your heart, your mind, your spirit, your soul. That's the same thing he did with the original temple. He walks in and he says, this don't belong here. It's not meant to be here. No, pay attention. He'll cast things out and then that word overthrew literally means to turn upside down. You wonder why you get the Holy Ghost and God tries to turn your pride into humility. 
He'd be flipping stuff over in your heart and in your mind. He'd say, hey, you got it upside down, boy. Flip it over. That's not how this goes. In order to go up, you go down. In order to be exalted, you get humble. God turns it upside down because what's been sitting in your life is wrong. Are you seeing what I'm seeing here? Here is the prototype. Why do you think, brothers and sisters, that he cast out devils? Because they were, they were inhabiting his temples. And God said, get out. If you wonder why right now God is dealing with you about casting things out of your life, it's because the Holy Ghost is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. If you wonder why things are being turned upside down, it's because the Holy Ghost is actually doing what it's supposed to in your life. If you're wondering why God is taking seats out, there's things sitting in your heart right now that shouldn't be there. There's things that are stopping you from becoming what God created you to be. All because you haven't let Jesus clean out the temple. Why would Jesus clean out the temple, the church, the body? Look at this. Verse 13, watch this. And Jesus, this is what he said. And he said unto them, it is written. Everybody say purpose. Everybody say the word of God. That's where we get our purpose. The Bible says it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. Are you catching that? In other words, Jesus is saying, I designed the temple for divine communication. And I made you for divine communication. I, the whole reason you exist is so that you can talk to God and so that God can talk to you. Oh, you don't believe. My house shall be called a house of prayer. It's hard to be called a house of prayer when you don't pray. And the whole purpose of our existence is right here. We're called to a relationship. That's the whole point of this thing. Now, I want to ask you a question here tonight. I want to ask you a question here tonight. How much praying are you doing? Brother, brother, brother Justin, if your house has a one carat gold that you nail to the wall, can you say that your house is gold? No, you say my house has a little bit of gold. See, there are people that try to say, I'm a house of prayer. But your prayer life is this deep. Because your prayer life is this deep. You're not living what you were created to be. Because God can't talk to you because you don't talk to him. You can't hear God. God reaches for you. God nudges you. In fact, let me go as far as to say this, because now I'm fixing to scare some folks. Some of the problems and the dilemmas that you're in is because God's trying to get you to pray. Yeah. 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 Oh, my God. Brother Mandela, I got hyperthyroidism. Now I have hypothyroidism. I've been dealing with this since I was 13 years old. It is the weirdest thing in the world. Weight fluctuates. You lose hair. Believe it or not, there was a time. My eyes are still big, but there was a time they were like out here. It was crazy. Hyperthyroidism is a, it is a mess, okay? And I remember I got so mad at God, and I said, God, I'm going to go on a massive fast, and you're going to heal me, and this is the way it's going to be. And I, got, I, started, I started arguing with God, and then God humbled me and said simply this, I couldn't get you to pray any other way. to myself you know what God if you want to heal me that's fine but if you don't that's fine also because if this is what's keeping me in prayer then let it be according to thy word we got it we got to catch this folks can I can I advise somebody something don't force God to make you pray you know what that well you know what we call that that's called crisis-oriented Christians. 
that they don't step up to be Christians until there's a crisis. Why not just be Christians? Why not just pray? Why not just be prayerful people? Why not just be a house of prayer? Why not just be true blue about my walk with God? And, and here's the thing. Check this out. If the people managing the temple would have been praying, there would not have been things to cast out, and there would not have been things to overturn, and there would not have been things being sold and seated in that temple. And so when people try to act all righteous, like, "Mm mm-hmm, I pray, Mm mm-hmm, your attitude lets me know you got things in your life that you ain't praying hard enough about. When you're, when you're still gossiping, but you're speaking in tongues, I'm trying to figure out. I'm glad you let God manage your tongue at the altar for a few seconds. I think God would appreciate if you let him rule your tongue when you leave the altar too. Is he Lord of your life? Is it actually his house? Or is it only his house on Sunday during the altar call when everybody's watching? That's why Jesus shows up. Everybody say, Jesus is real cool. He really is. Okay, Brother Matt, I want you to pay attention to this. What happens when we let Jesus in the temple and we let him do whatever he wants in the temple and he gets us to start praying again? Look at the next verse. Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. And the blind and the lame came to him where? There are, there are some healings that will never take place until you let Jesus in to do whatever he wants. There are some things that are never going to happen until Jesus has all access into your temple and is able to go down to the deepest parts, to the secrets you've been hiding, to the stuff you've been holding on to, to the stuff that you... There's a lot of us that tell Jesus, Lord, you can clean out 99%, but I'm holding on to this one. And God goes, you don't understand. If I don't clean out that 1%, you're not going to see the blind and the lame get healed. You're not going to see your blindness get healed. You're not going to see your... You know what blindness... Blindness is a condition that you can't see. God is trying to help you see. This is why you got to let Jesus in. Except the man is born again, he cannot... See, Jesus helps us see. You know what else Jesus helps us do? How can you go and do God's will when you're paralyzed? Oh, God, help me minister the way you gave it to me. There are people under the sound of my voice, you have been paralyzed because you're not letting Jesus in. You've been blinded because you're not letting Jesus in. And Jesus is saying, hey, why not just let me do what's best for you? Jesus said, I don't need my eyes opened. I don't need my legs healed. You do. I don't need miracles. You do. I don't need healing. You do. I don't need blessing. You do. So why don't you let me do what I know is good for you? Are we catching that? It's right there. There are some miracles. And I'm trying to help somebody here tonight. There are some miracles that will never take place in your life until you really let Jesus all in. Everybody say all access. All access. There is a little basketball show called All Access Pass. You ever heard of that, Brother Mandela? It would be all access. You're, you're a little young for that. But there's all access when you go back court and you interview all the great stars of the NBA. And it was an all access pass. That means they can go anywhere. Does Jesus have all access to your temple? Does, see, there's some people that are like, Jesus, you have access to my intellect, but you don't have access to my emotions. Jesus, you have access to my heart, but not my mind. Jesus, hey, can I tell you, I learned something a long time ago, uh, Brother Victor. Hey, if God steps into my temple and he says, you know, Jesse, I really don't like that show. It curses my name. It makes fun of me. It puts me down. I don't like it. Get it out. You know what I learned to do? Hello. Why? Because I don't want to miss my miracle. And you're either his house 
or you're the devil's house. There is no, people think, no, I'm, I'm, I am atheist. I, I don't belong to the devil or I don't belong to God. No, you belong to the devil. <laughs> Let's get that right. There's only two choices here, baby, black and white, up and down, heaven or hell. Okay? So you either belong to God or you belong to the devil. You're either his temple or, oh, God help me say, why do you think the world represents the temples of satanic worlds? Why do you think they paint themselves, they tattoo themselves, they do all of these things to themselves to, to change their original purpose? Why? Because they're sending a message to the world. I am owned by the world. This, I put a jersey on with Russell Wilson, but I won't bear the name of Jesus Christ. They're, they're sending a signal to the spiritual world. This temple is open to whatever God you want me to manifest. God's people say, we only got one God in here. We only got one spirit in here. We only got one true Lord in here. And that's why we give them our temples. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. When Jesus enters the temple, he's going to cast things out. He's going to turn things upside down, and he's going to return the temple to its original purpose. Amen. This is why he takes those hands of yours that used to clap for Russell Wilson, and he tells you, oh, clap your hands, all you people, yes. unto him. Yes. He repurposes the temple he gave you back to himself. Are you catching that? Yes. This is why where you go matters. What you say matters. What you see matters. What you wear matters. How you, what you give your praise to, all this stuff matters because it's all about temples. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. This is the truth. I'm trying to help somebody here today. Look at 21 and 15. I'm almost done, I promise. I got six minutes. I started late, so I got eight minutes. And uh, I started earlier so I can get at least 10 minutes. So God bless you, every one of you. You guys only get me once a week anyway, so you're welcome. Here we go. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna, the son of David, they were all, or they were sore displeased. Did you guys catch what happens when Jesus enters the temple? Yes. He does wonderful things. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how the people that let God really take possession of their temple tend to produce the most wonderful fruits? the most wonderful spirits, the most wonderful attitudes, the most wonderful personality. The, they're the most wonderful. Why? Because Jesus does wonderful things. Even the hater can see it. Are you catching this? I got, listen, Sister Crystal uh, Hughes, I've had a lot of enemies in my life. And... The Bible says that when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I've learned that if you'll let God work in you, even your enemies will be like, you're all right, bro, you're all right. <laughs> they start coming around. They're like, man, I used to really hate you, but man, I just, <laughs> man, you're actually, man. Ah, I wanted to shoot you, but now I want to high five you. Guys, Jesus wants you to know that if you'll let him in, he'll make a wonderful thing out of you. He'll do a wonderful thing in your life. He'll do a wonderful thing in your marriage. He'll do a wonderful thing with your children. He'll do wonderful things, but you've got to let him in. Amen. Amen by the baby. Praise God. Look at this. Look at verse 16. Look at Jesus' response. And Jesus said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? I want you to pay attention to this. Some people won't like what Jesus does to you. And, but Jesus is just fulfilling scripture. Jesus is just doing wonderful things. Jesus is just making you what you were created to be and designed to do. That's all he's doing. He's not doing anything negative to you. He's literally doing what's best for you. 
But in order to do that, we got to let him in. Now, here's a question, and I close with this. Man, I'm actually really doing good on time right now. What happens when someone doesn't want Jesus to do what he wants? This is about to blow you away. Because this is counterintuitive to what's taught about Jesus. The next verse, please. I want you to read that first four words with me. Catch that? Jesus left them. You know what the scariest moment, Sister Crystal, in my life? There was a moment where I thought Jesus left me. I couldn't sleep. I started reading the Psalm of David. Cast me not out of your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. And I prayed and I fasted and I wept and I went to an altar and I couldn't feel him at all. And I thought to myself, my God, what did I do? Is it my pride? Is it this? What is it? What, what have I done for him to leave me? Is it because I've resisted him so long that he's finally saying, hey, I tried, but you don't want to listen. What, what is it about God that he, he leaves us and moves on to the next city, to the next person? You know what God gave me a revelation, Brother Victor? Now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm hopeful, if your family hears this, let them know I am very sorry. I am very sorry. Every generation before you, God was trying to get them to realize that there's one God and that his name is Jesus and that they must be born again of water and spirit under baptism in Jesus' name. And God tried everything to get in. And God tried everything to get them to see it. And God tried everything to get them to obey it. And you know what happened? He moved on to the new generation. Pastor, I don't believe that. Really? Read the book of Exodus. When he could not get the people that came out of, of, of Egypt to change, he let them die in the wilderness and then gave the promises to another generation. I don't want to resist God to where God finally says, I'm done. Oh, you're not here. S Sister Paige, they're not believing me. Go, go to Genesis. Go to Genesis, Sister Paige. I want you to jump over. Go to Genesis chapter, uh, where is it at? Somebody help me with this verse. Where the Bible says that Jesus says it will, he will not always contend with man. Here it is. It's Genesis 6.3, please. Put it up there. I want them to see this. He warned us about this. He warned us he was like this way back when. So, don't per, so when Jesus moves on, don't act like, oh, I didn't know Jesus would do that. He warned us about this way back when. The Bible says, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive. Strive means fight, argue, wrestle with man. Yeah. For he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. You know what that, let me translate that to you in King James Northside. <laughs> this is King James Northside. I'm not always going to fight with you, and because of that, you're going to die. That's, not true. That's what it says right there. I don't want to fight God, Brother Victor, and then spiritually die. That's my greatest, like, no, 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 that's one thing I'm not doing. There's a lot of things you can get me to do because I'm crazy, but there's some things that I'm like, ain't doing it. I will not let God, move on. Keep working on me, Jesus. Would you stand with me here today? This is what I want us to pray about tonight before we leave. Number one, I want us to pray that God helps us grasp these incredible principles that he taught us tonight. This, what, this is, if I was in your shoes, this is what, I, this is what I'm going to pray. You can pray it if you want to, but this is what I'm going to pray. I want to be obedient. I want to be a worshiper. I want Jesus to be within me because that's part of being a biblical Christian. I never want Jesus to look at me and say, I can't, I can't save you. I can't change you. I got to move on. You know what happens?
When a man chases a girl that doesn't want to be caught, he moves on. You know what God does when he chases a man or a woman that doesn't want to be caught? He moves on. Because God made you and I in his image and in his likeness. We're not going to wait forever. And we're not going to chase forever. At some point, God's going to say, you either want me or you don't. But I can't keep fussing with you. If I have to, I'll keep you alive and I'll go after your kids. I don't want to do that. I want Jesus on the inside. Would you pray with me here tonight? Let's pray. Father... What an incredible revelation that you enter into our temple. Now it makes sense why you get the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden there's conflict and there's things that I can't listen to anymore. There's things I can't say anymore. There's things that I don't like anymore. There's things that don't entertain me anymore. It makes sense now, God, why this takes place when I got the Holy Ghost. Because right before you were crucified, you went into the final temple and you cleaned it out. And Lord, tonight, whatever I have inside of me that is not what you want within me, I pray that you would show it to me and that you would cast it out of me or that I would cast it out, God. I pray that if there are things inside of me right now, God, that are causing me to be counter to what you created me to be, I pray, God, that you would please Get it out of me. Turn the tables upside down. Get it out of my heart. Get it out of my mind. Get it out of my spirit. Lord, I don't want you to move on. I want you to dwell within me. I want you to change me. I want you to talk to me. I want you to, I want you to teach me. I want to feel your presence. I want to be transformed, God. I want to be somebody that others can look at and say, that is a wonderful thing. That was created by God. That was changed by God. That was developed by God. That 